dystopian times. You know, we saw Bernie Sanders lose in 2020. We just saw Nina Turner lose. We are dealing with, you know, a pandemic, a housing crisis, a student loan crisis. And every time you tune into the news and if they're talking about climate change, which is fairly rare, but if we learn about climate change, it's always bad news. This week we got the IPCC's uh, new report and it looks really, really bad. So my question to the panelists is how do we keep people engaged amid all of the doomerism? Because the way that I kind of feel sometimes, and I don't necessarily vocalize this because I don't want to discourage people, but I kind of feel like nihilism is is a little bit alluring. And I always feel this instinct to check out, like every extra loss that we feel, you know, Bernie Sanders losing, Nina Turner losing, I always feel the instinct to check out of politics. And, you know, I fight that. But I know that young people, they also feel that urge as well. And so I try to find ways to keep them engaged in politics that are destructive, try to find ways to get them to channel their anger and disillusionment with electoral politics and capitalism. But sometimes I don't have all the answers and I don't necessarily think that there's a perfect answer. Hence why I kind of wanted to bring in all of the uh, wonderful people here. Lance, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Like, what's the one thing that you think is helpful in trying to keep people uh, engaged um, and not just during election years, but, you know, during off years like now it's, it's such a, an open-ended question so feel free to take it wherever i mean this I was, is a lot uh, yeah well i was hoping i was going to be like the third person so, <laughs> I could, well, so i could jump in there and be like and by the way the corporations want you to be sad that's how they win don't give in to their so i'd sound powerful but instead i'm going to be like uh well um take some time please to uh log off like everyone yeah people use that as an insult uh but you know sometimes it's nice to uh you know touch grass touch ass touch sand uh, you know, sand is uh, sand is coarse uh, and all that kind of stuff but it does it does help with the mental health um in terms of what's going on i'd say uh, maybe we should celebrate victories more uh boisterously i don't know if there's a better word i'd use for that because there are still leftist victories going on all around the world and and not just concentrating on canada the united states but if you look at central and south america there has been some very good decided pushes towards leftist governments i know they are problematic i'm not i'm not going to try and open up a whole other can of worms here and get us talking about you know uh, geopolitics going on around the, uh, the globe but there are still there are more victories than sometimes people think. And when we just concentrate on the news itself, it's very hyper-commercialized to make us think, well, the vaccine apparently doesn't work 100% of the time. We were promised invincibility juice, and instead we're getting 97% uh, juice. Like, what the hell is going on, right? Uh, whereas there's, like, we can concentrate on the other good news, the places where mass vaccination is happening, like in British Columbia, the numbers are plummeting, you know, stuff like that. Sorry, I'm talking for a while. No, no, I, I think that that's, you know, that's a great start. I tend to focus on the negative and part of it is, and, and Sam probably has the same problem. You know, we cover the news and almost all of the news is negative. Like whenever there is a victory, I tend to try to over celebrate it, but oftentimes it's difficult. Uh, do you want to weigh in on this, Sam? Because you're the other like news video person on the panel um, and everyone else is kind of video slash streaming. But, you know, how do you like, how do you deal with this issue? Because I'm afraid, just like with videos that I post and covering certain news stories, that it's going to turn people off to electoral politics and politics in general. And I I'm trying not to do that. But at the same time, you know, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Sometimes maybe we can use doomerism to make it some sort of a spark or be the catalyst that, you know, encourages someone to get up and get involved, perhaps join DSA or something to of that nature. But how do you deal with this, Sam? Well, it is tough. I mean, there is a thin line, I guess, between, you know, doomerism and, and false optimism and trying to figure out you know, where to draw the line. Things are bad and, and we have to recognize that and tell people that. I do think that there is a, a bit of a problem in terms of, you know, taking a bigger picture that people don't like to, like Lance, you know, mentioned there are victories happening in South America, big victories, rewriting the, Const the Pinochet era constitution in Chile, mm -hmm. socialists coming uh, to power in Bolivia and in Peru. Um, and it, it seems like here in the U S the, the sort of doomerism popularity or the, the notion that there is no left, you, you hear that repeated a lot, um, in sort of leftist media circles, which is kind of odd for mm -hmm. someone like me, who's kind of been paying attention to politics for 20 years. And, you know, there was no left 20 years ago. I can assure you there's a lot more of something resembling a left today than there has been at any other point in my lifetime. And yeah, someone can counter and say, well, it's not like it was in the, you know, thirties and, and, you know, when we had militant 
labor unions and we had uh, uh, labor unions, you know, a third of workforce in a labor union. Sure, we're not there and we may not ever get there, but that like there is an entire left uh, media ecosphere. There's a lot more organizing on the left than there's been at any time in my life. And a lot of, I mean, all of us are, are, are here as a result of this new left space that's been created. I mean, when I first started doing this, um, I was working for uh, a guy named Tom Hartman, who is a progressive radio talk show host. And he was one of the few games in town, you know, 15 years ago. And I was working on RT with people like Abby Martin. And that was one of the few places that you could sort of get anti-imperial uh, leftist news content. And now there's just so many more sources. And I guess, you know, a debate can be had of whether or not that's advanced our goals, but I think it has very much so. So people just joining politics, you know, with the Bernie Sanders run, I can understand how disappointed they are by things. People who jumped in seeing Dennis Kucinich as the best option for the left on like the wings of a debate stage being ridiculed. Um, you know, there might be a little bit more optimism to the situation, but um, I guess there's a perspective here. And, you know, I, I bring that perspective and try to tell people, you know, what I, what I'm seeing, but at the same time, this, the IPCC report and the situation with climate change and the, the, the enormous task in front of us, it's, it's, it's hard to repel the doomerism. You just, yeah, we just have to lie and wait like for an opportunity. I mean, there's been doom throughout history for the left. Like it's a, kind of the default s situation for us. Yeah, that reminds me of something that Vosh said after Super Tuesday in 2020. Um, basically, you were talking to your audience and I was I was tuning in and you told them, look, Bernie Sanders, you know, he got blown out. This was before he was out of the primary, I believe. Um, and, you, you know, you were saying losses are kind of just like an inevitable thing. This is part of the process. And if you're going to be engaged in politics, you have to kind of expect this thing. You have to acknowledge that this is going to happen. And especially if you're a leftist, and I'm paraphrasing what you said, of course, this isn't verbatim. But, you know, if you're a leftist, you kind of have to expect that you are always going to be the underdog. This is the perpetual state of your life if you are fighting for the good thing. Um, and I've tried to like use that message, but you know, make it my my own. But I felt like it was really hopeful. Um, do you do you have anything like to add with regard to that message, Vosh? Because I felt like that was one thing that I tried to use to like keep my nieces and nephews who were like old enough to vote for the first time for Bernie Sanders engaged after the primary. You know, I'm it, varying success, right? Some of them don't care at all anymore. And they're, they're, that limited window is gone. But, you know, some of them are still engaged in politics. Like, what's your overall take on this? Like, what's your what's your advice for the youths, Vosh? Yeah, unfortunately, and I don't think this is exclusive to the left, but I do think it's a problem. I think there's an unfortunate narcissism in left-leaning mm. activism among some groups that reminds me a little bit of the logic of conspiracy theorists. If you set aside all the irrationality of a conspiracy theory, the underlying emotional core of it is that there's some broad truth people accept, but you're the one who knows what's really going on, and you're part of some epic battle against the establishment that be and that ultimately all of this all this knowledge you have is part of a narrative where you are part of the underdog overthrowing whatever system I and mean, whatever they believe QAnon, anti-semites they all have their theories um now of course leftists are the underdog in virtually every sense politically but our fight for civil rights isn't a narrative a lot of people get it in their head that like, oh, like in 2016, they realize, oh, my God, you know, you're right. We are being screwed over by the oligopoly. And then uh, 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 Bernie Sanders makes them aware of this. And then they get super doomer six months later when he loses. And it's like you were an, you're you're an infant. You've dipped your toe in this. Can you tell me any point in history, any group of left leaning people who you would think like accomplished everything they wanted? Or hell, any group of ideologically motivated individuals at any point in history. Can you ever think, like, in all of human history, do people who get involved in politics ever die happy? No. We never do. So stop expecting that your life is going to be part of some three-act arc 
where we overcome all the problems that you were made aware of in your lifetime. It's not going to be. You're going to set yourself up for misery if you focus on things from that narrative perspective. So don't. It's not. That's not how it works, okay? People, tens of billions of people have died throughout human history thinking that they were facing the end times, uh, watching their civilizations collapse, their ethnic groups being exterminated, plague ravaging their land, dr famine, drought. Sometimes they were right and sometimes they were wrong. But the narrative of recognizing injustice and then overcoming it singly in your lifetime, it's, it's a fake narrative. Latching onto it will only worsen your mood in the long term. But there is a solution and it's a very simple one, okay? Focus on yourself. Make yourself the kind of person who is good at advocating for the things you care about. That's what you need to focus on. Your day-to-day -day process, the thing that you adhere to, the thing that you base your mood around, isn't what you see in the news that day. It's how effectively am I acting as an agent for my own will? So stay happy, stay healthy, stay educated, and when the time arises that you may be useful to some service or cause, go for it. And that's what you should focus on. And if you do that, you'll be an infinitely better advocate for your ideals than somebody who engages in the opportunistic, you know, uh, bandwagoning of hitching a ride to whatever movement they think might have a chance at passing over the crest, realizing it won't, sinking into depression for six years, and then riding the next one. It is an ineffective and counterproductive cycle. Focus on yourself. And by being good to yourself, you can be good to the world. Yeah, I love that point. It kind of goes back to um, Lance's point about like touching grass and whatnot. And I made this point a couple of weeks ago on my program. Yeah. Every once in a while, um, we have to recalibrate, I feel like. Right. And I think that's a great point, Vosh. You're kind of alluding to this idea that like we all in some way suffer from main character syndrome. I, I mean, we're all podcast hosts and news show hosts. So certainly to a degree, we experience that. But it, I think a lot of people visualize their like the beginning of their political journey as the start of all of politics, when in actuality mm -hmm. you're jumping in and you're trying to continue a movement. Like uh, one thing that really bothers me is there's this sentiment that it goes beyond doomerism. It, it really is disempowering where people will think, you know what? Democracy in America is flawed. Therefore there's no reason to participate. Now is democracy flawed? Absolutely. I think that we need to do away with the electoral college. I think that we need to end gerrymandering and remove our first past the post electoral system because I don't want there to be a two party system, you know, perpetually. Having said that, though, democracy has never been like just this thing that you establish and it's perfect as it is. In the United States of America, at least, I don't even think you can argue that we were a real democracy at the beginning. But as you as like, you know, we we grow as a country you keep adding to that project like each generation in my opinion kind of like contributes in their way to democracy and further enhancing you know the democratization of the united states um it, it's never perfect and and trying to like stop people before they check out once they jump in and trying to like change their expectations for the better so that way it's more appropriate i think that's a really important thing uh demon mama did you want to jump in here because i know that you like when i tune into your stream you do a really good job at mixing up like very very like sad political issues heavy topics but then there's always this sense of like you know um camaraderie between you and your chat and you know you'll cool down with video games and like what do you think is like the best thing to like keep people engaged because basically this is my this is my my uh, thing here. I, I get people like I'm the boring news guy and people tune in during elections. And once they're there, I try to, you know, stop as many people as possible from leaving and keep them engaged. But that's not necessarily something that, you, you know, I'm not going to have a 100% success rate. So in your opinion, like what, what do you do to keep people, you know, uh, engaged and stop them from, you know, being a political nihilist? I, this is such a tough question to answer. But like, if you want to share your thoughts just in general. Yeah. Uh, this is something that I've been thinking about increasingly uh, over the course of my career as a streamer and over the course of my involvement in politics. And I've, I've been interested in politics for a very, very long time. And I've come to this position where I believe in a very, I don't know, organic form of politics. I think that um, it's, it's good and well for us to be informed on many topics to the greatest degree that we can, you know, and of course we have to sort of select, select those carefully. But I think one thing that there is a hunger for and that we're lacking is is connecting that in a real way to people's lives, the the, the day to day moments of their lives. Uh, I think especially here in the United States, like a lot of our politics centers around this, like um, these like checkpoints of like an election 
or a, a bill that might pass. And a lot of times we spend sort of just like digging into the um, digging into the details of such a thing when long after the fact, after we've cast our votes or or decided on our, our, our representatives or whatever, and there's nothing really we can even do to touch that thing. I, I like to focus and I've been increasingly focusing on things that people can touch. So, and this is incre incredibly true right now as we're talking about climate change and we're talking about um, COVID and some of these other just, I mean, they're dooms. They are apocalyptic scenarios that are so large that they're things that humans have grappled with through all of history. And I think that one of the ways that we do that is by taking the focus and, and, and turning it sort of, uh, like tuning the focus a little bit closer to us saying, okay, so who am I connected to? Who do I know? How can I make sure that these people are going to be okay? How can I make sure that, that, that my, I don't have to, that I don't see neighbors starving that, or that my family isn't hungry. What are the things that I can do? Who can I connect with that will help me lift myself up and that I can help lift them up? And I think this is something that I've been in, like increasingly interested in. One of the reasons why my, my stream is so community focused and I focus on encouraging people. We do community events on my discord all the time, specifically for the goal of getting people to meet each other and build actual social bonds because, and, and, it's limited. There's only so much that a content creator can do. A content creator doesn't, I mean, ideally doesn't run like a church or anything like that <laughs> or a movement. You know, there's there's only a certain level. But people are shockingly alienated right now. People are shockingly atomized. They are they find themselves almost sometimes blindsided. I know that happened to me where it's like the circumstances of life had me moving after a job after job. And it's like suddenly I don't know anybody around me. I don't know. Who do I know? I could connect with people on the internet. And then sometimes you connect with people who are near you and you can build these, these sort of networks. And I feel like that, like rebuilding these connections, rebuilding like material connections between people is just so incredibly important right now. And I've done two sort of big streams recently focusing on how we can actually do that. How do people visualize their relationships? How do people visualize their participation in politics? And I'm a little different in that I think you know, I mean, I do cover uh, electoral politics, but I'm probably the most doomer on this panel about like the electoral aspect of things. That doesn't mean I don't think that you should vote or that you shouldn't be informed on it. I really, really do. But I, I think that a lot of people get into the habit of watching things unfold when there are things that they could be doing in their life right now, even small actions that could be building a, a better political foundation for the world that they want to see happen. Um, something that I think about a lot as like a small offhand example of this is something like gardening. Um, and mm. that seems like such a small thing. Um, but, uh, but, 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 Learning a skill like that, a skill that can be shared with the community, if more people actually do that, they're not just themselves, but their community becomes stronger. They're sharing a skill that can keep people alive. And if you can encourage people to pursue those types of skills, to talk to each other, one of the reasons why my Discord uh, has a, a huge creative section that is specifically designed for people to share information about how to make art, how to make things themselves, how to teach each other, like how to use the tools that they're doing. The reason why I believe in that is because I think that people take those things off the internet and then they put them into the world and the world changes. It is a direct one-to-one -one thing. And I think that really is something that defeats doomerism. I think that we've gotten, we've gotten into a state where we're very much, politics is a spectator sport. People have heard that term mm. before, but it's, it's very much so. Um, when everything is deferred, when all of politics is sort of viewed as deferred across these big uh, life, you know, or these big milestone events of an election or whatever, when there are things that you could do to be making your your community, your particular political context, even if it's an online political context, stronger, more powerful, more capable of, I of directly influencing the world around them. And I think that's incredibly important for defeating doomerism. I, I think that's a really great point because, you know, politics is everything. So you're not going to fully detach politics from your life, but you can kind of dissenter it and, and distract yourself, for lack of a better word. I think that that's really important because, like, for me, I got to the point where I would basically base my entire mood 
uh, on on the outcome of a political election. And that's that's so unhealthy, which is why I think that like Lance's recommendation of touching grass and touching ass, whichever you prefer, if not both, maybe um, it really is important. And Lance, you do a lot of good like um, distraction streams like you do a movie night on the surfs. Um, did you want to add anything to this? Because I, I think that's actually a really like, you know, constructive thing to say for younger people. Um. Uh, yeah, I will add this. Like, if you are actually doomer about the current state of things, and I can understand why, like, keep in mind, what was the scene in 2016, like, pre-2016, before the Bernie Sanders runs, right? Before everyone was galvanized, before everyone suddenly thought that saying, like, oh, I I'm, I'm a social democrat, or I'm a democratic socialist, was something that was acceptable at the dinner table, and not something that would have your parents be like, communist, execute him, or anything like that, right? Like, all of a sudden, it was like, everyone was talking about this, and hey, wait, are we interested in theory, and are we going to read about this stuff, and now we're all united, and, and then there's this old man who's galvanizing all of us, and, and he's getting us all excited about all these ideas that, yes, all the money is being funneled the very rich and the working class are getting fucked over and we don't have any more unions anymore we don't have any more worker co-ops anymore and everything is fucking terrible and they're pointing the finger at things that don't matter they're pointing the finger every day at the immigrants so yes it's it's the people from across the pond that are going to attack us that's the real problem meanwhile the people who are fucking us over are right here and it's, it doesn't matter if it's in canada or america so people can become united people can come together and get galvanized and do like I would say decisive action. We just need to be inspired and and, and do something about it. Yeah, I think there is a, a a positive frame that you can put on the doomerism. And sure, there are, you know, people who who use it for, you know, benefit to get views, to get clicks, whatever. Right. Um, but I, you know, the the cert, like sudden rise in it, you know, does reflect. Um, people's expectations of what um, the government should provide for them and what sort of material interests should be met. People are getting this doomer feeling because their expectations have increased and their conditions have not increased. And the gap between those things is, is disheartening, especially, and not just in the near term and now, but especially in the future, um, as you look at a world that's gonna be changing due to climate change. Um, it's only going to get worse. So I, like people weren't really despairing that much in, in 2010. I don't remember. I mean, that we, we were legislation was the debt ceiling stuff. That was what's going on. Um, and it sucked. And, but there wasn't this, like, it's kind of was like, Oh, well, this is just kind of the way it is. This is politics in America. There's no left. There's Democrats and Republicans. But I think that, and it's not just Bernie, it was the material conditions on, on the ground after the financial collapse that was never resolved. And people just kind of getting eviscerated with, you know, not their wages, not going up and having to fill out their credit card to make ends meet and then going into debt. There are all sorts of reasons. And Bernie comes along and articulates these things. And I think a bunch of young people suddenly like, oh, we can have better things. We can organize our society in a different way. And when that didn't happen immediately, because Bernie wasn't elected, and even if he was, it wouldn't have happened, let's face it. Um, it, it, it turned into this like, well, well, you're not meeting our expectations that have rapidly increased. And I mean, there's there's theorists who have written about this, Davies and other people, of like how revolutions are started and stuff. But um, I don't see a revolution anytime soon. But the fact that you're getting this, you have to you have people's expectations of what society should look like have to be there. And you can look at the entire neoliberal project has been an effort to lower people's expectations of what the social contract should be, what government should provide to you. Um, and it seems like we're finally starting to like chip away at those ideas and start developing new ideas of what we're owed and what as citizens of the US of what our lifestyle should be like. Yeah, that's really important perspective because things are different now than they were even it, things now that, uh, you know, are are being discussed weren't even discussed at all, like Medicare for all, for an example, like we don't have Medicare for all yet, but we have shifted the Overton window. Sorry, the, I, the health care debate, the healthcare debate in 2009, where, when, when Obama came in was an absolute nightmare, yeah. where you had people like Joe Lieberman and Ben Nelson, who as bad as Joe Manchin is today, and I can't stand the man. Mm -hmm. uh, Ben Nelson and Joe Lieberman were the foils and they were far, far worse. You wouldn't see these guys mm. advancing a $3.5 trillion 
uh, framework, I guess it is right now. We'll see what it is at the end of the day. So, yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Oh, uh, I, I'm not I, sure. I, if it, I, I think I, you. I, I just I, had a little bit of a different perspective. Uh. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't. I think there's a little bit of a delay. I apologize. If you want to go first, go for it. Oh, sure. No, I'd be happy to. But then, yeah. Uh, I just want to say, I think the main character syndrome hit it on the head. Um, I think that there's a, like an incredible degree of counterproductive self-centeredness. Like, imagine if you could anthropomorphize the history of American progressivism. You somehow had some 250-year-old organism who was responsible in all ways for all progress made in this country. Imagine like from the perspective of that individual watching somebody enter politics in 2016 and then like after two years of being involved be like Ugh, this doesn't work nothing's <laughs> gonna work and then drop out it's like okay we would have nothing if everyone yeah. throughout history had had that attitude i mean nobody ever gets clean wins if all the union organizers back in the beginning of the 20th century had been as willing to give up because of the seeming insurmountability of their opponents then we would have nothing and our workers would have nothing i mean they had bombs dropped on them we have people and I don't want to get into this isn't like a millennial sensibility thing. I think a lot of it is just that we don't have a very strong existing infrastructure for a willingness for 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 sort of a, a means of effective engagement that. Mm -hmm. And I think people are more and more making politics their personality, uh, which is problematic for a number of reasons, not the least of which is because the needs uh, 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 towards change in a political system and the needs to define yourself as a person do not always coincide. And when you try to make them the same thing, that's going to lead people to make personality-driven political decisions and politically-based personality choices. And both of those can be really, really destructive. Um, politics is slow, arduous, gradual, messy, and often counterproductive. Personalities are the fanciful whims of whatever you think you are at the time and that's great and that's how it always should be but there's not much personality to be had in yep politics is slow struggle and we're just going to keep at it for decades and decades enjoying small victories and suffering small losses forever like that's not people don't like that it's not exciting so people mm -hmm. want to get involved almost to a parasocial extent with the political happenings of their time period and it just leads to people making really bad decisions yeah, that's a great point. Uh, Demon Mama, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I actually have some some sort of disagreements with uh, with both Sam and, and what Vosh has said here. So okay. the first one that I was going to respond to was uh, the idea that like people have asked for more and then gotten less. I actually don't think that's true. I think people have asked for less and still gotten less. Um, I think that like the the average like and this is somewhat anecdotal, but I would I would love to see like like a broader scale look into this. Um, but I think that people have been lowering their expectations. I think when I, like, I remember when I was younger, most of my peers were like, yeah, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get a house someday. Nobody thinks that now. And people I know, even my peers, some of my peers who are doing well, f sometimes feel lucky to have an apartment because of how rough things are right now. So I think that people have continually lowered their expectations and found that the answer is still lacking. Um, when it comes to politics, there's this, there's this like sort of trite saying, but that I kind of like to keep in mind, which is do not wait to strike until the iron is hot, but make it hot by striking. And I think that 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 is a good way of looking at politics. I think a lot of times we're sort of lulled into this um, constant waiting, waiting period. We're waiting for this. We're waiting for this. We're waiting for this. And um, that's one of the areas where I sort of disagree with Vosh a little bit. I don't really think that um, you can separate personal and political in the same way like political movements are often very inorganic or, or very organic and very messy they are sometimes flashes in the pan sometimes the energy that arises is like almost unpredictable like we have with something like uh like the george floyd um uh, like protests and stuff which and and they're going up against a system that is very cold and and calculating but the thing is that we don't always have to wait on that system and uh and again that's not to say that there's no need to participate in when the chance comes to vote it's just there's all this time and all of this energy in between um something that has really shaped my outlook on politics was living through a couple of disasters um, when I lived in California before I started streaming, we lived through one of the worst wildfire seasons. I mean, only now surpassed by this wildfire season. Um, and we had our power just shut off. Like one day we just got a letter in, or we got a phone call and they said, hello, 
your area has been selected for a power shutoff in order to prevent forest fires. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. You can't contest it because it is the state has given the power to the power company to make that call. And they did. And then our power was gone. The, the power for our entire town was gone and nobody was ready for it. We didn't have power. We just lost. I couldn't watch streams. I couldn't research anything. I couldn't do my job. I just and there was no recourse. The only recourse was to try and solve the problem. And to to and, and we ended up like talking to our neighbors. We ended up like finding out who had a generator. We ended up like actually solving issues that arose when that when that like infrastructure was taken away at last. And we didn't wait for anything. No aid came. We never got aid from the government. We never got aid from any of the polit local political parties. That aid just didn't come. And when COVID hit here in Seattle, where I live, um, I was involved for a long time with this incredible mutual aid group that's like organized by some anarchist collective. And it was incredible. And they did that exact same thing. They, there was no, there was all of this fighting back and forth in Congress, all of this, you know, is the money going to come? Is the money going to come? They put up a Google web, a Google sheet, and they orchestrated at the last time that I was working with them, which was some time ago, admittedly, I know that they've raised a lot of money, $300,000 worth of groceries and groceries delivery to people who were, were so in need of food that they were searching Facebook for groups that would be able to give them food. This wasn't like a party that was giving food to its par members. This was people who were running, who were out of food and they were looking for it. And they put food into the mouths of those people, giving those people another day to live. I think <clears throat> that fo changing our focus to that sort of politics, a politics that can be, can be a bit, a bit more uh, accepting of people's sort of personal weirdness and their personality and their organicness, a, a, a politics that is willing to engage with that at face value without judgment and move forward with that organic assumption built in, I think is very, very powerful. And I, I think we should focus on that more personally. I, I kind of see common ground, not to be, you know, a fence sitter here between you and Vosh. I, I think that there's common ground on that particular, um, statement because i do think that you know your, your press personality i think there are some benefits to that being linked to politics but i do see how it can become something that's problematic if i mean maybe perhaps it depends on the personality i mean we can all think of individuals who are very problematic personalities on the left um who i i won't name but you know it it just kind of depends um on the situation and perhaps the personality but vash i'll, I'll let you weigh in on that Oh no, I just think that um I, I just think that in a lot of ways, you know, um we should treat our political engagement with the kind of steadfast um and tenacious involvement that we would say a job. Uh not that to say that we need to commit 8 hours a day to it or anything like that, but that as a, as a part of our interest in and willingness to contribute to a broader collective goal um we make it something that we care about we treat it as such and we do so with some degree of seriousness but we do so with the understanding that the responsibilities were it taking the the effects of our actions they extend beyond just us they're not just a reflection of our personal willpower our personal wishes i'll give you an example okay biden i don't like biden i've never liked biden i didn't like voting for biden but i did vote for biden uh if i had considered a vote an extension of my personality a reflection of my personal interest and identity then i would have simply not voted or what i would have voted for a third party candidate or something but I don't. I consider it a stark and utilitarian choice about who is the least terrible person who has a shot at being in there. So I cast a vote for Biden. A lot of people turn it into this big identity thing, that they're not the mm -hmm. sort of person who would vote for Biden, or they're not the sort of person who would look at what's going on in the world today and continue to invest time and energy into it because things are going so poorly that it's easier. It's emotionally easier to just withdraw. And that's what a lot of people are doing. They're withdrawing. They're saying... Uh, Oh, this just doesn't work. It's never going to work. We're doomed. You know, they kind of just want to cross their arms and smirk as everything else falls apart. You know, and I think mm -hmm. this is a horribly counterproductive attitude. There are people who have done a lot of good in much, much, much worse circumstances 
than what we're dealing with today, you know? I mean, obviously, I'm a live streamer, so I've got nothing to complain about. But even, like, broadly, left-leaning people today in this country probably can't hold a candle to what the left felt back at the beginning of the 20th century or how the left felt back during World War II. Or, like, for example, when America refused to take Jews that were being sent out from Germany prior to their execution, you know? Like, imagine how being a leftist must have felt at that time, you know? Like, seeing all of that happen. It's always been a process of suffering. But they still did good work back then, you know? So, if all of them, they'd thrown their hands up, ah, nothing but a revolution will fix this. We never would have gotten anything. But that is a very personality-based decision. It's a product of an emotional fallibility, an over-emotional investment into what's going on and a need to withdraw to shelter your own emotions. That's why after Bernie Sanders lost, I didn't have much of a problem endorsing Biden right after. It's not because I didn't love Bernie because I wasn't disappointed. And it's not because I like Biden. It's because it was never about how I felt. So it was an easy yeah. choice for me. I mean, it sort of it, is, right? I mean, voting is sort of how you feel. I don't, I don't, I don't think I take that view where people who you know, didn't want to vote for Biden somehow put their personality above, above what was good for the country at the time, because, you know, I, it gets, it treads awfully close on, on scolding powerless people on what they should be doing oh, in sure. a system that does not provide them any options and has completely eviscerated them. So, and ultimately like the people who are sitting on the fence or didn't want to vote for for Biden because they're too left of Biden is a very insignificant portion of the electorate and not really driving any of the bad or their lack of participation isn't really what's responsible for what's 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 the engine of destruction that's happening. No, but that's kind of a deflection, right? right? right. It's I mean, Sorry, it's right. a significant portion of the left. The discourse about Bernie or Bust or not voting for Biden was super present online. It still is super, super present online. Is it a huge part of the electorate? No, but we're talking about the mentalities of leftists here. And yeah, if a person thinks that not voting is a preferable choice to voting for Biden, I'm okay scolding them for that. I mean, we're at the probably the the sort of and I don't know, maybe maybe there's more influence of that sort of sect of the left, but Biden still prevailed in the election despite, you know, their whatever, how many people held their nose up or didn't hold their nose up and chose not to vote. Um, Can I respond to that, Mike? Yeah, Lance, know, do you want to jump this, in? How this works. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that I, Sam, I'm totally on board with uh, a diversity of tactics. I think that's very, very important. I think that you should have people doing mutual aid. You should have people doing unionization. You should have people doing worker cooperatives, all that kind of stuff. But in terms of harm mitigation, I think that's also incredibly important because if we don't engage in those kind of tactics or even better yet, you know, try to get progressive or leftists into office, then we cede that ground to liberals and conservatives and they dominate those arenas. And trust me, they are very invested in maintaining the levers of power, getting in there, making sure they stack the courts with judges making sure they stack the courts with supreme judges so it just haunts us for years to come so the left can't kind of like stay by the side and be like i'm going to do um like a fourth party or i'm going to do some kind of a i don't know i'm not voting just to show that i don't care about this process like we cannot let that ground simply be controlled by conservatives and liberals would be my point well i'm, I'm not against i'm not saying people shouldn't vote i think i mean look i i mean i'm a, I'm a communist i i I don't think that the Democratic Party is ever going to get us to a situation where we need to go. But I do recognize, and I don't agree with people. Okay, I do recognize that you can still improve the lives of millions of people by electing Democrats over Republicans in certain situations. And I don't subscribe to the belief that like it's necessarily counterintuitive or counterproductive to any sort of anti-capitalist struggle to settle for electing Democrats in the short term. Otherwise, like, what's the point of fighting for things like Medicare for all, which isn't socialism or anything. Um, and you could argue would delay whatever kind of heightened contradictions that could lead to a revolution or whatever down the road. So I don't, I don't really buy into that. But at the same time, I think that voting is the least uh, effective type of politics you can engage in. Um, or the least impactful or important type of politics you individually can engage in. And I think that yet we place so much importance on it, mainly because we all are kind of political commentators and reporters. So, you know, we operate in this scene around elections all the time. 
Oh, I just, I mean, to me, it, it, we shouldn't focus on it too hard. It's just, it seemed like so many people were making the objectively wrong choice. You know what I mean? It'd yeah. be like, it'd be like flushing after you take a shit, you know? That's not a huge part of my brain, like telling people they need to take a, like flush after they take a shit. But if I, if I realized quite suddenly that all the people around me didn't do that, it, it would it would it would suddenly become a much bigger deal to me, you know. Um, I don't know. It just feels like pretty straightforward. You get Biden and whatever, even if it's the least important thing, it's still something you got to do. Um, it's not to me so much of an issue because like the online left represents a huge voting block because it doesn't. To me, it was more of an issue of a sort of misplaced or misguided accelerationism because even if a leftist doesn't vote for Biden, like to me, it's not so much the vote I care about. It's that they're the type of leftist who doesn't see a difference between the kind of harm Biden could do versus the kind of harm Trump could do. And that, to me, suggests the existence of a, a whole other host of issues, uh, which may be significantly more concerning than their actual singular vote. You know, like that, that could lead into a whole un bunch of other stuff, like people saying Biden is worse than Trump or people underestimating the threat of fascism in this country or people who think that Trump was better on foreign policy. And it gets like this whole like the like a branching web of bad ideas. I think there's too much hype hyperbole on the left. Uh, and I do think that that's a problem. Like there are many people online who will say there's zero difference between Donald Trump or Joe Biden. And there's some people who even self-identify as leftists who will argue that Joe Biden is worse than Donald Trump, which is if you're a leftist, I, I don't think that there's an argument there. Having said that, though, I do recognize that, you know, times are tough, like doomerism is the subject. And for me, I like as as a podcast host, I feel like I made a different political calculation than I would have if I wasn't a podcast host. So like after Bernie Sanders lost, I was very like, fuck Joe Biden. Like, I, I'm so I'm so done. I'm not going to vote for him. Fuck him. Like on Super Tuesday, I was also like that was a very like my dad died on Super Tuesday. So I see oh, Bernie right. Sanders losing. My dad dies. So at that point, emotionally, I was like so irrational. I was like, you know what? I live in Oregon. It doesn't matter what I do. And fuck Joe Biden. I'm not going to vote for him. But then as time went on and Trump became more authoritarian um, and I, I heard different perspectives, I thought, you know what, I can't just like, you know, hold my nose up in the air and, and say, you know what, I'm leftier than thou because I didn't vote for Joe Biden because I live in a swing state. Because at the same time, I, I'm telling my viewers, well, I'm not going to vote for Joe Biden, but you definitely should if you live in a swing state. So it's kind of like this like, there's there's this fakeness to it right and that's how i felt like i felt like it wasn't fair that there's this expectation that you know my, my swing state viewers support joe biden so we could stop donald trump but i don't have to do that i don't have to feel gross you know about holding my nose um and it was it was vosh's video where he was talking about bernie or bust and i shared it on twitter and i got a lot of backlash because they were like oh well how can you share this video when he's doing these ad hominem attacks calling people dumb fucks i'm like honestly though when he like said dumb fuck, like something like clicked in me. I'm like, oh yeah, I am being kind of a dumb fuck here and I should probably stop putting my emotions before everything. So basically long story short, like what I try to do is acknowledge that like people are people and we should have a diversity of tactics as as Lance was saying. And, you know, we should, I don't know, just try to try to do our best to keep people engaged. Like I have, like in, in 2016, for example, a lot of folks hated Hillary Clinton, myself included. And like for my mom, she registered to vote for the first time uh, in her 60s for Bernie Sanders. And then after that, she's like, okay, well, I guess I'm back to being apolitical. I'm not going to vote. I don't care enough. Um, and so voting for a third party for her, like for Jill Stein back in, in 2020, I'm like, well, look, if that's going to keep you engaged and you vote and then you vote down ticket for other Democrats, uh, you know, the Senate, I think that that's perfectly fine. So like finding ways to keep people engaged is is important to me but it's not a perfect science because everyone is so different like a lot of people were probably turned off by vosh calling everyone dumb fucks but that actually resonated with me somehow because i'm a fucking weird person but it, it worked for me you know and sometimes we need to be shaked other people you know you approach them more you know softly and in, in, in a more uh, i don't know personable way it just it, it kind of depends but i'm, I'm rambling at this point demon i think you wanted to jump in as well i'll give you the last word on this before we move yeah, on to sure. the next segment this is a topic I, I think is like super, super interesting to me. And and mm -hmm. the, there's the whole touching on the whole Bernie or bus thing. I mean, I think people are prone to be very emotional online in general. They they state their sort of unfiltered thoughts into Twitter. And it can be hard to figure out what people are like actually going to do with that. 
um for the record like i made my own like videos against the bernie or bus position because i think it doesn't help anything i wish that people would view voting as a strategic chore as a thing mm. that you've got to do because you want to set up the ground for being as easy as possible for you to get what you want um but that's kind of a like that's a hard sell when our entire our entire entire political system tells us that like voting is the number was like the mark of your american identity there's mm -hmm. so much of that emotion that is infused in making e elections the the sort of center of your personal politics and uh and i think that people feel a lot of disempowerment i think that there is a um a a sense that like yeah i did the things i'm supposed to do that i've been told i was supposed to do my whole life and it hasn't done anything for me i'm still sitting here with no power in a in a mountain in california or whatever whatever name what it is if you want to go about covid or, or whatever name 100 different things and i think that disempowerment is like sort of the underlying factor that inspires a lot of these like bad conclusions because people conclude that they're disempowered and they don't know why they're disempowered. They don't know what it is that's disempowering them. Um, I, I really like that, um, that Vosh was talking about um, like the, the sort of like old lefty politics. And I think it brings up something, or at least I would like to highlight something about like older leftist politics in America specifically is that it was based around bonds. Leftist politics mm. in the past was based around a union or your community or your the company town that you lived in you would uh your farm your friend's farm these things that where people had very real connections and they could make that connection up to the next level up to whatever next level of politics there is they go we need to get this president in here because our union will suffer our community will suffer if that guy gets elected. I think it becomes easier to sell people on strategic votes and on voting as a block as opposed to voting as like a personal expression if they see their voting in the context of a community, of of a of their vote laying a sort of foundation for this network of bonds that they have. I really, really fixate on on alienation and the separation that a lot of people have these days, because I think it influences a lot of our politics. Um, I also think that we have to start thinking about how communities are formed in a different way. I don't think we're ever going back to a union based politics. I don't think we're ever going back to like party based politics in the same way that we used to. Um, I don't know that unions are going to have like a big comeback. It'd be really interesting if they did. I think unions do some really good stuff. But what I think we can start doing is we can start um, building structures like and I'm very interested in building things, but I think we can start building structures and building communities that allow people to, to like autonomously help one another in the right direction. And those people's bonds will drive them in a better direction than the, than the direction that this society does, which if we look at the trends in employment, if you, we look in the trends in, in general well-being over the last like 10 years or so, over the Trump presidency especially, people work all the time and our workplaces are increasingly... Uh, uh, are increasingly alienated in and of themselves. You do jobs online, working from your own home. You don't know any of your coworkers. You work a gig job. You can't know any of your coworkers because they're all just random cars through an app. How are you going to build a sense of community? How are you going to build a sense of solidarity? We all recognize solidarity is vital to the politics of the left. That solidarity is like what the underlying factor of left politics. But how do you do that? We need to figure that out. We have to figure out how we rebuild solidarity, actual solidarity. How do we, you know build bonds between people again that will inspire their politics. And I think that will have a, if we can figure out how to reconnect people, how to make people understand their context, they will be more interested in politics. And they're more likely to be willing to make a strategic vote on something like Biden. Um, if they're, if they're, if they're truly convinced that they're not powerless, that they can go, oh yeah, whatever, vote for Biden, sure, whatever, check it right off. I don't even think it has to be a matter of suppressing your emotions. I just think we have to change the emotional context. Say, yeah, it's not a big deal to vote for Biden. We're just doing a strategic vote. Now let's get back out there and let's do this thing with our online community, with our IRL community, with our physical like household community or our town community. These things that give you a sense, a feeling of political power because you can actually impact something around you as opposed to sort of just like, throwing your metaphorical paper airplane in the direction of Washington, D.C. and hoping to hear back someday while your power is still out. And I, I understand why people feel so doomer. I understand why they feel so disempowered. And I think it's because like one of the things that has uh, 
that distinguishes the modern left from the left of the past is that the left of the past went through the Cold War era era and got all of their bonds systemically destroyed. You know, um, like, I mean, seriously, we're talking organizations that have been broken and collapsed through strike breaking, through union busting, through deregulation has completely shattered the bonds that were there. And we need to do that. We need those bonds. Those bonds are the, the foundation of everything else that comes after that.